Chapter Ten, Section Three of Capital, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Capital: A Critical Analysis of Capitalist Production, Volume One, by Karl Marx. Translated from the third German edition by Samuel Moore and Edward Aveling, and edited by Frederick Engels. Part three: The Production of Absolute Surplus Value. Chapter ten: The Working Day. Section three: Branches of English Industry Without Legal Limits to Exploitation. We have hitherto considered the tendency to the extension of the working day the werewolves hunger for surplus labor in a department where the monstrous exactions not surpassed says an english bourgeois economist by the cruelties of the spaniards to the american redskins caused capital at last to be bound by the chains of legal regulations footnote quote, the cupidity of mill owners whose cruelties in the pursuit of gain have hardly been exceeded by those perpetrated by the Spaniards on the conquest of America in the pursuit of gold. End of quote. John Wade, History of the Middle and Working Classes, Third Edition, London, 1835, page 114. The theoretical part of this book a kind of handbook of political economy, is, considering the time of its publication, original in some parts, e.g. on commercial crises. The historical part is, to a great extent, a shameless plagiarism of Sir F. M. Eden's The State of the Poor, London, 1797. End of footnote. Now let us cast a glance at certain branches of production in which the exploitation of labor is either free from fetters to this day, or was so yesterday. Quote, Mr. Broughton Charlton, county magistrate, declared as chairman of a meeting held at the Assembly Rooms, Nottingham, on the 14th January, 1860, that there was an amount of privation and suffering among that portion of the population connected with the lace trade unknown in other parts of the kingdom, indeed in the civilized world. Children of nine or ten years are dragged from their squalid beds at two, three or four o'clock in the morning, and compelled to work for a bare subsistence until ten, eleven or twelve at night, their limbs wearing away, their frames dwindling, their faces whitening, and their humanity absolutely sinking into a stone-like torpor, utterly horrible to contemplate. We are not surprised that Mr. Mallet, or any other manufacturer, should stand forward and protest against discussion. The system, as the Reverend Montague Valpy describes it, is one of unmitigated slavery, socially, physically, morally, and spiritually. What can be thought of a town which holds a public meeting to petition that the period of labor for men shall be diminished to eighteen hours a day? We declaim against the Virginian and Carolinian cotton planters. Is their black market, their lash, and their barter of human flesh more detestable than this slow sacrifice of humanity which takes place in order that veils and colors may be fabricated for the benefit of capitalists? End of quote. Footnote. Daily Telegraph, 17th January, 1860. End of footnote. The potteries of Staffordshire have, during the last twenty-two years, been the subject of three parliamentary inquiries. The result is embodied in Mr. Scriven's report of 1841 to the Children's Employment Commissioners, in the report of Dr. Greenhow of 1860, published by order of the Medical Officer of the Privy Council, Public Health, Third Report, 112 to 113. Lastly, in the report of Mr. Long of 1862, in the first report of the Children's Employment Commission of the 13th June, 1863. For my purpose, it is enough to take, from the reports of 1860 and 1863, some depositions of the exploited children themselves. From the children we may form an opinion as to the adults, especially the girls and women, and that in a branch of industry by the side of which cotton spinning appears an agreeable and healthful occupation. Footnote. Conform 
F. Engels, Lage, etc. Pages 249 through 251. End of footnote. William Wood, nine years old, was seven years and ten months when he began to work. He ran moulds, carried ready-moulded articles into the drying-room, afterwards bringing back the empty mould, from the beginning. He came to work every day in the week at 6 a.m., and left off about 9 p.m. Quote, I work till nine o'clock at night six days in the week. I have done so seven or eight weeks. End of quote. Fifteen hours of labor for a child seven years old. J. Murray, twelve years of age, says, I turn jigger and run molds. I come at six. Sometimes I come at four. I worked all night last night till six o'clock this morning. I have not been in bed since the night before last. There were eight or nine other boys working last night. All but one have come this morning. I get three shillings and sixpence. I do not get any more for working at night. I worked two nights last week. Fernio, a boy of ten. I have not always an hour for dinner. I have only half an hour sometimes, on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Footnote. Children's Employment Commission, First Report, etc., 1863. Evidence, pages 16, 19, 18. End of footnote. Dr. Greenhoe states that the average duration of life in the pottery districts of Stoke-on-Trent and Wolstanton is extraordinarily short. Although in the district of Stoke only 36.6% and in Wolstanton only 30.4% of the adult male population above 20 are employed in the potteries, among the men of that age in the first district more than half, in the second nearly two-fifths of the whole deaths are the result of pulmonary diseases among the potters. Dr. Boothroyd, a medical practitioner at Henley, says, Each successive generation of potters is more dwarfed and less robust than the preceding one. In like manner, another doctor, Mr. McBean, since he began to practice among the potters twenty-five years ago, he had observed a marked degeneration especially shown in diminution of stature and breadth. These statements are taken from the report of Dr. Greenhoe in 1860. Footnote. Public Health, Third Report, etc., pages 102, 104, 105, and the footnote. From the report of the commissioners in 1863, the following. Dr. J. T. Arledge, senior physician of the North Staffordshire Infirmary, says... The potters as a class, both men and women, represent a degenerated population, both physically and morally. They are, as a rule, stunted in growth, ill-shaped, and frequently ill-formed in the chest. They become prematurely old, and are certainly short-lived. They are phlegmatic and bloodless, and exhibit their debility of constitution by obstinate attacks of dyspepsia, and disorders of the liver and kidneys, and by rheumatism. But of all diseases, they are especially prone to chest diseases, to pneumonia, phthisis, bronchitis, and asthma. One form would appear peculiar to them, and is known as potter's asthma, or potter's consumption. Scrofula, attacking the glands or bones or other parts of the body, is a disease of two-thirds or more of the potters. That the degenerescence of the population of this district is not even greater than it is, is due to the constant recruiting from the adjacent country, and intermarriages with more healthy races. Footnote. Children's Employment Commission. First Report, page 24. End of footnote. Mr. Charles Parsons, late house surgeon of the same institution, writes in a letter to Commissioner Long, amongst other things, I can only speak from personal observation and not from statistical data, but I do not hesitate to assert that my indignation has been aroused again and again at the sight of poor children whose health has been sacrificed to gratify the avarice of either parents or employers. He enumerates the causes of the diseases of the potters, and sums them up in the phrase, long hours. The report of the commission trusts that a manufacture which has assumed so prominent a place in the whole world will not long be subject to the remark that its great success is accompanied with the physical deterioration, widespread bodily suffering, and early death of the workpeople, by whose labor and skill such great results have been achieved. Footnote. Children's Employment Commission, 
page 22 and page Roman 11. End of footnote. And all that holds of the potteries in England is true of those in Scotland. Footnote. Children's Employment Commission. Page Roman 48. End of footnote. The manufacture of lucifer matches dates from 1833, from the discovery of the method of applying phosphorus to the match itself. Since 1845, this manufacture has rapidly developed in England, and has extended especially among the thickly populated parts of London, as well as in Manchester, Birmingham, Liverpool, Bristol, Norwich, Newcastle, and Glasgow. With it has spread the form of lockjaw, which a Vienna physician in 1845 discovered to be a disease peculiar to lucifer matchmakers. Half the workers are children under thirteen, and young persons under eighteen. The manufacture is, on account of its unhealthiness and unpleasantness, in such bad odour that only the most miserable part of the labouring class, half-starved widows and so forth, deliver up their children to it. Quote, the ragged, half-starved, untaught children. End of quote. Footnote. Children's Employment Commission. Page Roman 54. End of footnote. Of the witnesses that Commissioner White examined, 1863, 270 were under 18, 50 under 10, 10 only 8, and 5 only 6 years old. A range of the working day from 12 to 14 or 15 hours, night labor, irregular meal times, meals for the most part taken in the very workrooms that are pestilent with phosphorus. Dante would have found the worst horrors of his inferno surpassed in this manufacture. In the manufacture of paper hangings, the coarser sorts are printed by machine, the finer by hand, block printing. The most active business months are from the beginning of October to the end of April. During this time, the work goes on fast and furious, without intermission, from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. or further into the night. J. Leach deposes, Last winter, six out of nineteen girls were away from ill health at one time from overwork. I have to bawl at them to keep them awake. W. Duffy, I have seen when the children could none of them keep their eyes open for the work. Indeed, none of us could. J. Lightbourne, am thirteen. We worked last winter till nine, evening, and the winter before till ten. I used to cry with sore feet every night last winter. G. Epstein, that boy of mine, when he was seven years old, I used to carry him on my back to and fro through the snow, and he used to have sixteen hours a day. I have often knelt down to feed him as he stood by the machine, for he could not leave it or stop. Smith, the managing partner of a Manchester factory. We, he means his hands, who work for us, work on with no stoppage for meals, so that the day's work of ten and a half hours is finished by 4.30 p.m., and all after that is overtime. Footnote. This is not to be taken in the same sense as our surplus labor time. These gentlemen consider ten and a half hours of labor as a normal working day, which includes, of course, the normal surplus labor. After this begins overtime, which is paid a little better. It will be seen later that the labor expended during the so-called normal day is paid below its value so that the overtime is simply a capitalist trick in order to extort more surplus labor, which it would still be, even if the labor power expended during the normal working day were properly paid. End of footnote. Does this Mr. Smith take no meals himself during ten and a half hours? We, this same Smith, seldom leave off working before 6 p.m. He means leave off the consumption of our labor power machines, so that we... Iterum Crispinus, are really working overtime the whole year round. For all these, children and adults alike, 152 children and young persons and 140 adults, the average work for the last 18 months has been at the very least 7 days 5 hours, or 78 and a half hours a week. For the 6 weeks ending May 2nd this year, 1862, the average was higher, 8 days or 84 hours a week. Still this same Mr. Smith, who is so extremely devoted to the pluralis majestatis, adds with a smile, Machine work is not great. 
so the employers in the block printing say, hand labor is more healthy than machine work. On the whole, manufacturers declare with indignation against the proposal to stop the machines at least during meal times. A clause, says Mr. Otley, manager of a wallpaper factory in the borough, which allowed work between, say, 6 a.m. and 9 p.m., would suit us, note, very well, but the factory hours, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., are not suitable. Our machine is always stopped for dinner. What generosity! There is no waste of paper and colour to speak of, but, he adds sympathetically, I can understand the loss of time not being liked. The report of the Commission opines with naivete that the fear of some leading firms of losing time, i.e., the time for appropriating the labour of others, and thence losing profits, is not a sufficient reason for allowing children under thirteen and young persons under eighteen working twelve to sixteen hours per day to lose their dinner, nor for giving it to them as coal and water are supplied to the steam engine, soap to wool, oil to the wheel, as merely auxiliary material to the instruments of labour during the process of production itself. Footnote Children's Employment Commission Evidence, pages 123, 124, 125, 140, and 54 End of footnote No branch of industry in England we do not take into account the making of bread by machinery recently introduced has preserved up to the present day a method of production so archaic so, as we see from the poets of the Roman Empire pre-Christian, as baking but capital, as was said earlier, is at first indifferent as to the technical character of the labour process. It begins by taking it just as it finds it. The incredible adulteration of bread, especially in London, was first revealed by the House of Commons Committee on the Adulteration of Articles of Food, 1855 to 1856, and Dr. Hessel's work, Adulterations Detected. Footnote alum finely powdered or mixed with salt is a normal article of commerce bearing the significant name of baker's stuff and the footnote the consequence of these revelations was the act of august sixth eighteen sixty for preventing the adulteration of articles of food and drink an inoperative law as it naturally shows the tenderest consideration for every free trader who determines by the buying or selling of adulterated commodities to turn an honest penny Footnote. Soot is a well-known and very energetic form of carbon, and forms a manure that capitalistic chimney sweeps sell to English farmers. Now, in 1862, the British juryman had in a lawsuit to decide whether soot, with which, unknown to the buyer, 90% of dust and sand are mixed, is genuine soot in the commercial sense, or adulterated soot in a legal sense. The Ami du Commerce decided it to be genuine commercial suit, and non suited the plaintiff farmer who had in addition to pay the cost of the suit and the footnote. The committee itself formulated more or less naively its conviction that free trade meant essentially trade with adulterated, or as the English ingeniously put it, sophisticated goods. In fact, this kind of sophistry knows better than Protagoras how to make white black and black white and better than the Eleatics, how to demonstrate ad oculus, that everything is only appearance. Footnote. The French chemist Chevalier, in his treatise on the sophistications of commodities, enumerates for many of the six hundred or more articles which he passes in review, ten, twenty, thirty different methods of adulteration. He adds that he does not know all the methods, and does not mention all that he knows. He gives six kinds of adulteration of sugar, nine of olive oil, ten of butter, twelve of salt, nineteen of milk, twenty of bread, twenty-three of brandy, twenty-four of meal, twenty-eight of chocolate, thirty of wine, thirty-two of coffee, etc. Even God Almighty does not escape this fate. See Rouard de Car on the falsifications of the materials of the sacrament. De la falsification des substances sacramentelles. Paris, 1856. and a footnote. At all events, the committee had directed the attention of the public to its daily bread, and therefore to the baking trade. 
At the same time, in public meetings and in petitions to Parliament, rose the cry of the London journeyman bakers against their overwork, etc. The cry was so urgent that Mr. H. S. Trevenhair, also a member of the Commission of 1863 several times mentioned, was appointed Royal Commissioner of Inquiry. His report, together with the evidence given, roused capitalist or landlord or sinecurist, is commanded to eat his bread in the sweat of his brow. But they did not know that he had to eat daily in his bread a certain quantity of human perspiration mixed with the discharge of abscesses, cobwebs, dead black beetles, and putrid German yeast, without counting alum, sand, and other agreeable mineral ingredients. Footnote Report, etc., relative to the grievances complained of by the journeyman bakers, etc., London, 1862, and Second Report, etc., London, 1863, and the footnote. Without any regard to His Holiness' free trade, the free baking trade was therefore placed under the supervision of the state inspectors, close of the parliamentary session of 1863, and by the same act of parliament work from nine in the evenings to five in the morning was forbidden for journeyman bakers under eighteen the last clause speaks volumes as to the overwork in this old-fashioned homely line of business Quote, the work of a london journeyman baker begins as a rule at about eleven at night at that hour he makes the dough a laborious process which lasts from half an hour to three-quarters of an hour according to the size of the batch or the labour bestowed upon it he then lies down upon the kneading board, which is also the covering of the trough in which the dough is made, and with a sack under him, and another rolled up as a pillow, he sleeps for about a couple of hours. He is then engaged in a rapid and continuous labour for about five hours, throwing out the dough, scaling it off, moulding it, putting it into the oven, preparing and baking rolls and fancy bread, taking the batch bread out of the oven, and up into the shop, etc., etc., the temperature of a bakehouse ranges from about 75 to upwards of 90 degrees, and in the smaller bakehouses approximates usually to the higher rate than to the lower degree of heat. When the business of making the bread, rolls, etc. is over, that of its distribution begins, and a considerable proportion of the journeymen in the trade, after working hard in the manner described during the night, are upon their legs for many hours during the day, carrying baskets or wheeling handcarts, and sometimes again in the bakehouse, leaving off work at various hours between 1 and 6 p.m., according to the season of the year, or the amount and nature of their master's business, while others are again engaged in the bakehouse in bringing out more batches until late in the afternoon. Footnote First Report, etc., page Roman 6, and a footnote During what is called the London season, the operatives belonging to the full-priced bakers at the west end of the town generally begin work at 11 p.m. and are engaged in making the bread, with one or two short, sometimes very short, intervals of rest, up to 8 o'clock the next morning. They are then engaged all day long, up to 4, 5, 6, and as late as 7 o'clock in the evening, carrying out bread, or sometimes in the afternoon in the bakehouse again, assisting in the biscuit baking. They may have, after they have done their work, sometimes five or six, sometimes only four or five hours sleep, before they begin again. On Fridays they always begin sooner, some about ten o'clock, and continue in some cases at work, either in making or delivering the bread, up to eight p.m. on Saturday night, but more generally up to four or five o'clock Sunday morning. On Sundays the men must attend twice or three times during the day for an hour or two to make preparations for the next day's bread. The men employed by the underselling masters, who sell their bread under the full price, and who, as already pointed out, comprise three-fourths of the London bakers, have not only to work on the average longer hours, but their work is almost entirely confined to the bakehouse. The underselling masters generally sell their bread in the shop. If they sell it out, which is not common, except as supplying chandler's shops, they usually employ other hands for that purpose. It is not their practice to deliver bread from house to house. Towards the end of the week, the men begin on Thursday night at ten o'clock, and continue on with only slight intermission until late on Saturday evening. End of quote. Footnote. First report, etc., page, Roman, 71. End of footnote. Even the bourgeois intellect understands the position of the underselling masters. Quote, the unpaid labor of the men was made the source whereby the competition was carried on. End of quote. Footnote. 
George Reed, The History of Baking, London, 1848, page 16, and a footnote. And the full-priced baker denounces his underselling competitors to the commission of inquiry as thieves of foreign labor and adulterators. Quote, they only exist now by first defrauding the public and next getting eighteen hours' work out of their men for twelve hours' wages. End of quote. Footnote. Report, first, etc. Evidence of the full-priced baker Cheeseman. Page 108. End of footnote. The adulteration of bread and the formation of a class of bakers that sells the bread below the full price date from the beginning of the 18th century, from the time when the corporate character of the trade was lost, and the capitalist in the form of the miller or flour factor rises behind the nominal master baker. Footnote. George Reed, as before. At the end of the 17th and the beginning of the 18th centuries, the factors, agents that crowded into every possible trade were still denounced as public nuisances. Thus the grand jury at the quarter session of the justices of the peace for the county of Somerset addressed a presentment to the lower house which, among other things, states that these factors of Blackwell Hall are a public nuisance and prejudice to the clothing trade and ought to be put down as a nuisance. The case of our English wool, etc., London, 1685, page 6 and 7, and a footnote. Thus was laid the foundation of capitalistic production in this trade, of the unlimited extension of the working day and of night labor, although the latter only since 1824 gained a serious footing, even in London. Footnote. First report, etc. End of footnote. After what has just been said, it will be understood that the report of the commission classes journeymen bakers among the short-lived laborers, who, having by good luck escaped the normal decimation of the children of the working class, rarely reach the age of forty-two. Nevertheless, the baking trade is always overwhelmed with applicants. The sources of the supply of these labor powers to London are Scotland, the western agricultural districts of England, and Germany. In the years 1858 to 1860, the journeyman bakers in Ireland organized at their own expense great meetings to agitate against night and Sunday work. The public, e.g. at the Dublin meeting in May 1860, took their part with Irish warmth. As a result of this movement, day labor alone was successfully established in Wexford, Kilkenny, Clonmel, Waterford, etc. Quote, in Limerick, where the grievances of the journeymen are demonstrated to be excessive, the movement has been defeated by the opposition of the master bakers, the miller bakers being the greatest opponents. The example of Limerick led to a retrogression in Ennis and Tipperary. In Cork, where the strongest possible demonstration of feeling took place, the masters, by exercising their power of turning the men out of employment, have defeated the movement. In Dublin, the master bakers have offered the most determined opposition to the movement, and by discountenancing as much as possible the journeymen promoting it, have succeeded in leading the men into a quiescence in Sunday work and night work, contrary to the convictions of the men. End of quote. Footnote. Report of Committee on the Baking Trade in Ireland for 1861. End of footnote. The committee of the English government, which government in Ireland is armed to the teeth and generally knows how to show it, remonstrates in mild though funereal tones with the implacable master bakers of Dublin, Limerick, Cork, etc. Quote, the committee believe that the hours of labor are limited by natural laws, which cannot be violated with impunity, that for master bakers to induce their workmen, by the fear of losing employment, to violate their religious convictions and their better feelings, to disobey the laws of the land and to disregard public opinion, this all refers to Sunday labor, is calculated to provoke ill feeling between workmen and masters, and affords an example dangerous to religion, morality, and social order. The committee believe that any constant work beyond twelve hours a day encroaches on the domestic and private life of the workingman, and so leads to disastrous moral results interfering with each man's home and the discharge of his family duties as a son a brother a husband a father that work beyond twelve hours has a tendency to undermine the health of the working man and so leads to premature old age and death to the great injury of families of working men thus deprived of the care and support of the head of the family when most required End of quote. footnote report of committee on the baking trade in ireland for eighteen sixty one End of footnote so far we have dealt with Ireland. 
On the other side of the channel, in Scotland, the agricultural labourer, the ploughman, protests against his thirteen to fourteen hours' work in the most inclement climate, with four hours' additional work on Sunday, in this land of Sabbatarians, whilst at the same time three railwaymen are standing before a London coroner's jury, a guard, an engine driver, a signalman. A tremendous railway accident has hurried hundreds of passengers into another world. The negligence of the employee is the cause of the misfortune. They declare with one voice before the jury that ten or twelve years before the labour only lasted eight hours a day. During the last five or six years it had been screwed up to fourteen, eighteen, and twenty hours, and under especially severe pressure of holiday-makers, at times of excursion trains, it often lasted for forty or fifty hours without a break. They were ordinary men, not cyclops. At a certain point their labour-power failed. Torpor seized them. Their brains ceased to think, their eyes to see. The thoroughly respectable British juryman answered by a verdict that sent them to the next assizes on a charge of manslaughter, and, in a gentle rider to their verdict, expressed the pious hope that the capitalistic magnates of the railways would in future be more extravagant in the purchase of a sufficient quantity of labour-power, and more abstemious, more self-denying, more thrifty in the draining of paid labour-power. Footnote. Reynolds Newspaper, January 1866. Every week this same paper has, under the sensational headings, fearful and fatal accidents, appalling tragedies, etc., a whole list of fresh railway catastrophes. On these, an employee on the North Staffordshire line comments, Everyone knows the consequences that may occur if the driver and fireman of a locomotive engine are not continually on the lookout. How can that be expected from a man who has been at such work for twenty-nine or thirty hours, exposed to the weather, and without rest? The following is an example which is of very frequent occurrence. One fireman commenced work on the Monday morning at a very early hour. When he had finished what is called a day's work, he had been on duty fourteen hours fifty minutes. Before he had time to get his tea, he was again called on for duty. The next time he finished, he had been on duty fourteen hours twenty-five minutes, making a total of twenty-nine hours fifteen minutes, without intermission. The rest of the week's work was made up as follows. Wednesday, fifteen hours. Thursday, fifteen hours thirty-five minutes. Friday, fourteen and a half hours. Saturday, fourteen hours ten minutes making a total for the week of eighty-eight hours forty minutes. Now, sir, fancy his astonishment on being paid six and a quarter days for the whole. Thinking it was a mistake, he applied to the timekeeper, and inquired what they considered a day's work, and was told thirteen hours for a goodsman, i.e. seventy-eight hours. He then asked for what he had made over and above the seventy-eight hours per week, but was refused. However, he was at last told they would give him another quarter, i.e. ten pence. Reynolds Newspaper, 4th February, 1866, and a footnote. From the motley crowd of labourers of all callings, ages, sexes, that press on us more busily than the souls of the slain on Ulysses, on whom, without referring to the blue books under their arms, we see at a glance the mark of overwork, let us take two more figures, whose striking contrast proves that before capital all men are alike, a milliner and a blacksmith. In the last week of June, 1863, all the London daily papers published a paragraph with the sensational heading, Death from Simple Overwork. It dealt with the death of the milliner Mary Ann Walkley, twenty years of age, employed in a highly respectable dressmaking establishment, exploited by a lady with a pleasant name of Eliza. The old, often-told story was once more recounted. Footnote. Conform F. Engels, as before, pages 253 and 254, and the footnote. This girl worked, on an average, sixteen and a half hours, during the season often thirty hours, without a break, whilst her failing labour power was revived by occasional supplies of sherry, port or coffee. It was just now the height of the season. It was necessary to conjure up in the twinkling of an eye the gorgeous dresses for the noble ladies bidden to the ball in order of the newly imported Princess of Wales. Marianne Walkley had worked without intermission for twenty-six and a half hours, 
with sixty other girls, thirty in one room, that only afforded three of the cubic feet of air required for them. At night they slept in pairs in one of the stifling holes into which the bedroom was divided by partitions of board. Footnote. Dr. Letherby, consulting physician of the Board of Health, declared, The minimum of air for each adult ought to be in a sleeping room 300, and in a dwelling room 500 cubic feet. Dr. Richardson, senior physician to one of the London hospitals, With needlewomen of all kinds, including milliners, dressmakers, and ordinary sempstresses, there are three miseries. Overwork, deficient air, and either deficient food or deficient digestion. Needlework, in the main, is infinitely better adapted to women than to men, but the mischiefs of the trade, in the metropolis especially, are that it is monopolized by some twenty-six capitalists, who, under the advantages that spring from capital, can bring in capital to force economy out of labor. This power tells throughout the whole class. If a dressmaker can get a little circle of customers, such is the competition that, in her home, she must work to the death to hold together, and this same overwork she must of necessity inflict on any who may assist her. If she fail, or do not try independently, she must join an establishment where her labor is not less, but where her money is safe. Placed thus, she becomes a mere slave, tossed about with the variations of society. Now at home, in one room, starving, or near to it, then engaged fifteen, sixteen, aye, even eighteen hours out of the twenty-four, in an air that is scarcely tolerable, and on food which, even if it be good, cannot be digested in the absence of pure air. On these victims, consumption, which is purely a disease of bad air, feeds. Dr. Richardson, Work and Overwork, in Social Science Review, 18th July, 1863, and a footnote. And this was one of the best millinery establishments in London. Marianne Walkley fell ill on the Friday, died on Sunday without, to the astonishment of Madame Eliza, having previously completed the work in hand. The doctor, Mr. Keyes, called too late to the deathbed, duly bore witness before the coroner's jury that Mary Ann Walkley had died from long hours of work in an overcrowded workroom and a too small and badly ventilated bedroom. In order to give the doctor a lesson in good manners, the coroner's jury thereupon brought in a verdict that the deceased had died of apoplexy, but there was reason to fear that her death had been accelerated by overwork in an overcrowded workroom, etc. "'Our white slaves!' cried the Morning Star, the organ of the free traders, Cobden and Bride. "'Our white slaves, who are toiled into the grave, for the most part silently pine and die.'" Footnote. Morning Star, 23rd June, 1863. The Times made use of the circumstance to defend the American slave-owners against Bright, etc. "'Very many of us think,' says a leader of July 2nd, 1863, "'that while we work our own young women to death, using the scourge of starvation, instead of the crack of the whip, as the instrument of compulsion, we have scarcely a right to hound on fire and slaughter against families who are born slave-owners, and who, at least, feed their slaves well and work them lightly.' In the same manner, the standard, a Tory organ, fell foul of the Reverend Newman Hall. He excommunicated the slave-owners, but praised with the fine folk who, without remorse, make the omnibus drivers and conductors of London, etc., work sixteen hours a day for the wages of a dog. Finally, spake the oracle, Thomas Carlyle, of whom I wrote in 1850, zum Teufel ist der Genius, der Kultus ist geblieben. In a short parable, he reduces the one great event of contemporary history, the American Civil War, to this level, that the Peter of the North wants to break the head of the Pole of the South with all his might, because the Peter of the North hires his labor by the day, and the Pole of the South hires his by the life. Macmillan's Magazine, Ilias Americana in Nutia, August 1863. Thus, the bubble of Tory sympathy for the urban workers by no means for the rural, has burst at last. The sum of all is slavery. End of footnote. Quote, it is not only in dressmakers' rooms that working to death is the order of the day, but in a thousand other places, in every place I had almost said, where a thriving business has to be done. We will take the blacksmith as a type. If the poets were true, there is no man so hearty, so merry as the blacksmith. 
He rises early and strikes his sparks before the sun. He eats and drinks and sleeps as no other man. Working in moderation, he is, in fact, in one of the best of human positions, physically speaking. But we follow him into the city or town, and we see the stress of work on that strong man, and what then is his position in the death rate of his country. In Marylebone, blacksmiths die at the rate of thirty-one per thousand per annum, or eleven above the mean of the male adults of the country in its entirety. The occupation, instinctive almost as a portion of human art, unobjectionable as a branch of human industry, is made by mere excess of work, the destroyer of the man. He can strike so many blows per day, walk so many steps, breathe so many breaths, produce so much work, and live an average, say, of fifty years. He is made to strike so many more blows, to walk so many more steps, to breathe so many more breaths per day, and to increase altogether a fourth of his life. He meets the effort. The result is that producing for a limited time a fourth more work, he dies at thirty-seven for fifty. End of quote. Footnote. Dr. Richardson, as above. End of footnote. End of part three. Chapter ten. Section 3